I don't want to talk French, so to speak, and I really don't want to be crass, more or less. But you know, the only way to communicate what I'm about to say is to say it. Sometimes I piss people off. <laughs> oh, not in video, not really. <laughs> you see, sometimes people read something. You know, and I always try to tell people that have watched the video or when I write, you know, that look, you know, I can't plan on when or what or the environment you might read something I have to say. But I can guarantee one thing. It probably will upset you if you're not ready to hear it. And that's the way that all of us are. You see, the timing of the Lord is the timing of the Lord, but the timing of man usually is rotten. <laughs> and I have a tendency of being brutally honest in some things. Now, I'm not trying to say that everything I post or write is the best way or the most advantageous way to present it, but it is prayed about. It is considered. It is well thought out and planned for a purpose because God is in it. God is the one who directs me to use the ability to write, to state things that are correct, to allow him to use for his purposes, which I have no idea until someone reacts to them, what his purpose is. Most of the time, people will read something and, you know, if they're smart, they'll ignore it. You know, if, it, if it's something that I say is false, then, you know, most people know that I can defend the position that I stand in when it comes to the scriptural aspect of it. But you see, a lot of people, they don't really want to hear in the wrong place at the wrong time the right thing. Meaning, hey, you know, if I if I run up to you in a bar, you know, and you're sitting there, you know, buddying up with, you know, the world, you know, and kind of saying, hey, you know, yeah, you know, on Sunday mornings I watch football games, you know, and I just put back a few, you know, and I just saw you at church. I'm going to come over to you and say, hey, how was church last Sunday? You know, and you may not want to be reminded that you went to church when you're with those kind of buddies because, hey, sorry... You know, I'm not one of those kind of people that can compromise directly just to spare your pride or ego. But I am somebody who understands when you get your feelings hurt. Because you see, I love you. I'm willing to tell you the truth. I'm willing to admit to you that there may be something that you said that's deceiving someone else, that's leading someone else in the wrong direction. I remember I had a buddy. It was a very interesting case because it goes along the lines of what I'm trying to say in this post, you know, or in this video. He was a genuine, caring individual. He had a lot of health issues that, you know, I won't discuss because they're personal issues and he divulged them to me and, you know, I'll keep them private. But he had some personal issues that didn't affect his reasoning or rationale or way he did things. But he was part of a church that I went to and he was probably, well, okay, the Lord told me he was an elder. I mean, he was just one of those kinds of people that, man of God, you know, the guy knew his stuff, you know, he knew the Bible, he, you know, pretty, pretty dogmatic, but still solid as far as his dogmatism was concerned. He knew the straight and narrow and stuck to it. And so I was fascinated by that because, you know, it's like, well, you know, usually when you find somebody that's that dogmatic, they're kind of like hiding something else. Well, you know, as it turned out, you know, once he had already been used by the Lord in this venue that we were both in, you know, this church, then God used him to confront somebody and, you know, they were in error, you know, because they were breaking the law, basically, and they were confronted by him because he's actually a person that deals with the law. So he had to say something and the person would not change their way. So he reported him. <laughs> he had to. It was his position that was at jeopardy. And so having said that, Unfortunately, I had to break off contact with him later because he started sending me these emails. You know, the kind of emails, you know, you're sitting around at work, you know, and somebody sends you an email and you look at it and you go, that's funny. <laughs> you know, it's kind of makes fun of someone, you know. It shows them in a negative light. It tends to, you know, maybe tear them down a little bit, but it's not that bad, you know, stop. Not that bad, you know. You kind of you kind of look at a few of them and you go, oh, okay, you know. Then you gradually learn to ignore them because, you know, 
one man's liberty is another man's grace and you extend mercy to people that you know they don't know any better so you try to ignore it you know and you you deal with it and you set it aside but the funny thing was was that what started off as casual suddenly became worse I started getting these unbelievably provocative pictures of voluptuous women and I was shocked I thought well why are they coming in my email and it turned out to be from this gentleman you know that I knew and I thought, you know, I told him and I wrote back and I said, look, you know, I don't know what you're looking at, but, you know, frankly, I don't think it's wise. I think you should not be doing this, you know, and he never really responded, just kind of kept sending them because he was sending them to everybody. You know, people in law enforcement, people in all kinds of varieties of society, they were all kind of like, you know, amused by it because it was one of those kind of things, you know, they were technically funny edgy to the point of being questionable, definitely not something a conservative Christian would do, but, you know, not something that a Christian might not do. Then they progressed. Suddenly I was confronted with an issue that I had to deal with. The man was sending topless, technically topless, pictures around that I said, you know what, I wouldn't want anyone to be seeing this. So I finally told him, you know, I'm going to have to cut you off if you keep sending this kind of email. And I didn't get a response, so he sent a few more, and I cut them off. Then I noticed my wife was getting them. And I went, whoa, and I drew the line. So we had to, you know, kind of distance ourselves, you know, from that. And one man's opinion, you know, that got ticked off of me probably separated a friendship that we've had for a while, you know. And he, you know, is doing his thing, you know. And unfortunately, he may not see it as being bad, and I've confronted the issue and dealt with it and left it in the Lord's hands. The same thing happens to me on the internet. You see, I see people that think it's just funny. You know, uh, you know, let's let's dress up, you know, the president like in a dress, or let's you know call him a Nazi or something, some lie. You know, I don't know about you, but when I was in the Marine Corps in my day, if you did something to your commanding general or your general, or your lieutenant, or anyone else up the chain of command, you were out the chain of command. You were excused from the military, period. No questions asked, you were gone. Because it was a question of honor. Now, I learned something from a pastor called Romaine that told me how to evaluate all these things that we see on the internet. He said, put Jesus in it and if you can say that it's honorable and it's glorious and it's honoring him and it's glorifying him then you have no problem with it well you know there's a lot of stuff out there that maybe people shouldn't be passing around because it doesn't do anybody any good they think it's funny but the reality is it's not and gradually you know I've had to confront people like with some things that you know they they start telling me, you know, like, oh, you know, you got to keep the Sabbath or whatever. You know, and I'll say false because one of the things that happens a lot on the Internet is people will post things thinking that they're only writing to one or two people. They don't think of themselves as standing up in front of a congregation of thousands of people watching them, reading what they have to say or listening to what they have to say, and being influenced then to either make a choice to follow Jesus or to follow their teaching or to follow some other way of perspective that they're personifying by what they're doing. Oh, they don't treat that that seriously. They don't look at it that way. But the interesting thing is, the Bible does. Now, it's not just the Bible in a legalistic way that we say, oh, well, that's, you know, that's just the Bible. Huh. You know, anybody can interpret it any way they want to. No, it's the Holy Spirit that says that. It's Jesus himself who said, in the idle words, you know, that you speak, you know, like in humor, the joking around, the, you know, smoking around, the kind of like playing around, you know, those are the things God holds accountable to you. And so when someone sends them, you know, out on Facebook or on Twitter, they are known by that. And Calvary chapels especially and some other ministries, you know, treat kind of serious their reputation, you know, because they don't want to be responsible for someone else's sin that they may have committed unless they participate in it. And even then, sometimes most Christians won't even admit they participated in it. And that's the problem there is with posting things that you should not have done. 
A lot of times people will do that and I'll say, no or false, and they'll get reactive rather than active about searching out to see why something might be wrong to post or false or misleading or maybe detrimental to themselves because you could be sued now for what you post on the internet. You can be taken to court for things that you say on your Facebook page. You can be literally challenged by anyone for the information that you post on a private social network like Facebook and Twitter. So. I find it interesting that while the world has gotten carried away with being able to do tabloids and say anything they want to do, Christians haven't re-examined themselves to see if they're telling the truth in love or whether they're being a part of the problem and gossiping and tearing down others and causing strife and division. Oh, but we agree to disagree agreeably. No, we don't. I disagree with you forcefully. I agree with you adamantly. I disagree with you to your face. Because face to face is where I see your post going with me. Because you see, I read it. You put inside my brain this garbage that I have to now get rid of. And I have to either place it someplace and then prevent it from happening to other people. Or I just have to let it go. And do what? Let others see, participate, or be deceived? Oh, but it's not that bad. Really. 90% of what we're told in this generation that Christians learn and non-Christians learn is from television. We're told now that this generation growing up in the information age, 85% of what they believe in comes from the internet. It's not filtered. It's what they believe in. I find myself challenged as a born-again Christian not as a leader in a ministry, because I am a leader in a video ministry, but just as a born again Christian, I find myself challenged to not confront every single person out there that's doing some really wacko stuff. Now, I don't, but I feel that because I say, What are you doing? You know, and I want to shake somebody and say, Don't you get it? This is what's causing problems with this. You know, it's one causes the other. You reap what you sow. You're planting seeds of dissension and strife, you're causing these problems to happen and you want more of it to happen? Just keep pushing it on someone else. Repost, share, like, tell someone else how wrong what you're doing is. You see, that I don't understand. So I find it interesting that I tend to, no offense, I want to say the words one more time, piss some people off. It's almost like provocateur. You know, God wants us to provoke one another to love. And believe me, I am one of those persons who is provoking you to love. Trust me, I am. Now, I'm not really meaning to do it the way I am doing it, but that seems to happen sometimes. Can you love someone like me who just told you you're wrong and then prove it? Are you willing to examine the truth, mano y mano, and say, you know, you're right. I have had interestingly enough, lots of conversations with people that like me or care about what I say, because they don't really know me, because otherwise they wouldn't even got ticked off in the first place, but like me in some way or something that I'm saying, and then they get mad and they leave. They disappear from Facebook. They're, they're gone. They un unfriend me or whatever it is. A few weeks down the road, some of them will contact me and say, you know, I don't know what got into me. I was having a bad day or, you know, whatever it may be, you know, and I'm like, yeah, okay, you know, didn't change my opinion of you. I still love you, you know. I loved you when you posted something wrong. I loved you when you posted something right. I don't change my choice to love you. I only comment on what you're doing at the time. If I see a brother in sin, I'll say, you're in sin, dude. You know, you're screwing up. If I see someone walking in the street, I'll say, hey, you know what? You're walking in the street. If I see someone walking the straight and narrow, I'll say, hey, you know what? You're walking the straight and narrow. I don't have to compromise what I see because I have to testify to what I know. I am a witness of my own sinfulness as well as a witness of everyone else's righteousness and sinfulness, both. Because what I see, someone could ask me. And what I testify to is the truth that I have perceived with my own hands, my own eyes, and my own ears that I've looked at and examined in light of what the scripture says. So you see, when you are a witness,
to Jesus Christ. You're not just a witness for the gospel's sake only. You're a witness to the examples of what people are doing. And you are getting the opportunity to share the mercy and grace that the God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as well as, you know, whoever you want to say, you know, Martin, Luther, King, John, whatever. Um, you are an exemplar or an exemplar of giving out grace to those who have been caught up in the flesh so that they could come back to you and share with you and once again restore fellowship. But you don't have to sit there and say, oh, <laughs> it's funny. No. As a matter of fact, you probably should go, you think that's funny? And you know, I used to answer, and I know this is going to happen, you know, because it happened at Big Calvary until Romaine finally said something about it in one of the meetings, but Big Calvary people used to ask me, how you doing? And I'd say, not too good. they go, ooh, and walk away. Or I'd say, well, you know, I got a headache and a backache, and uh, walk away. When I were what? fine, great, how you doing? Wonderful. You know, and I'd go see and they'd be yelling at their kids or doing whatever, you know, because I'd follow them. I'd go see how they were doing. Because I was curious, is this a platitude or is this a question? Because Jesus said something interesting to the people. He said, let your yes be yes or let your no be no. Don't forswear yourself by the temple, by the flag of the United States of America. Don't swear allegiance to anything or anyone, not even by God's own throne. Because that's not your authority to be able to do. Jesus said, don't do it, but rather trust in the Lord with all your heart to turn to him, ask him what you should do. And you know, I kind of got it, but I don't know that everyone got the same message, you know, because I see everyone else doing the opposite, you know. And so I always wonder sometimes when I'm asking them, hey, did you read this part? And they think I'm a rebel rouser or causing some division or strife, and I'm really just asking them, hey, Maybe you didn't know what the scripture says. Or maybe you didn't understand what Jesus said. Because that's the bottom line, is that I don't really care, per se, what you do for yourself when it comes to salvation. Because if you're saved, you're saved. I'm not going to worry about you. What I care about is when you post something or write something that has the power of influence to mislead or deceive or to cause someone to stumble. You know, I just don't want children looking at some of the things you might be posting. I don't want adults reading some of the things that are misleading. I don't really want to see anyone wind up in hell that I couldn't have somehow prevented them making the wrong choice because someone else offered them multiple choice questions when there was really only one answer to what they were asking. You see, that means there are times where, yes, you and I won't agree. Maybe you'll be right. And maybe I'll have to swallow my pride and come to you and say, sorry, no, <laughs> forgive me, no. But you basically come to you and say, you know, that was a good word you gave me, thank you. Because you see, we're told in Proverbs, a very interesting thing that I learned really young, was that rebuke a wise man and he'll thank you. 90% of the time, I don't hear much thanking about what I might be saying disagreeing. But every now and then, like I said, I'll get these people to come back to me and share. And you know, I love them because they're, they're humble enough and they're wiser than I am to come back and say, you know, it doesn't matter what I, what I believed in. What matters is I care more about our friendship than I care about being right. And, you know, they don't say it in those words or terms, but that's what they mean, you know, because they'd rather have the communion of the fellowship of His Spirit than to have the confrontation and contention that has gone on between us. Because we're told in the Scriptures that if your brother has ought against you, then go and reconcile yourself to your brother. Otherwise, don't even bother coming to the temple. And usually it takes, oh, I don't know, about a year or two sometimes for some pastor to get to that message, for some person to come back to me and share with me what they felt I had offended or they had offended or been offended by something that I wrote because usually they're not offended by anything I do videos on because they think I'm a nut. <laughs> but in videos, at least I get the chance. At least there's the opportunity to confront the situation and recognize what the bottom line is 
and that's the carnality of where that person is coming from because the one thing I'll always ask them every time that it boils down to it, bottom line if they just go through this whole long line of trying to argue about it did you do what Jesus said did you ask him really no they didn't it's obvious am I carnally minded where there are envy strife and divisions among you are you not carnal? 1 Corinthians 3.3 3. The natural man or unbeliever knows nothing about carnality. The desires of the flesh warring against the flesh or the, I should say the desires of the flesh warring against the spirit and the spirit warring against the flesh which began at rebirth are what produce carnality and the awareness of it. Think about that. The natural man with his lust thereof serving his own flesh is not at war with carnality, but rather the person who has become born again is the one who is struggling with carnality because only when you are warring against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh are you even aware that there is such a thing as carnality. Paul said, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh, Galatians 5.16. In other words, carnality will disappear as the spirit leads us and appears in us as we are transformed by the renewing of our mind through the spirit of God. Are you quarrelsome and easily upset over small things? <laughs> Me personally, I people say, well, you know, they'll write me back and say, Oh, calm down. Don't be so upset. You're too worked up. And I'll write back, Really? I said, I'm laughing. I don't know what you're reading, but I think it's funny. And you know, that's what people don't get when I'm writing. Most of what I'm reading is so dumb, I think it's stupid. I just, you know, it's like, you know, if we were talking, you know, we brought up the points that, you know, are being made, you know, supposedly on, you know, some serious issue. You know, I'd be going, oh, come on, give me a break. You know better. Come, get real. You know, did you really think that? I mean, come on, let's look at this. You know, look at this scripture and look at that one. You really think that's what it says? Nah, you know, and I know. Yeah, I know. It's okay. And, you know, we would wink at each other or we would, you know, pat each other in the back for our wisdom, you know, and we'd, we'd kind of shuffle it, you know, and stuffle it, you know, and, you know, kind of do the two step, you know, where you're trying to get along with each other and fellowship, you know, and you just kind of like, you know, work it, you know, to, you both agree, and then finally you just go, yeah, you know, maybe it wasn't that big a deal. You know, that person kind of comes along, you know, because of the way that you portrayed and were able to bring the rest of the Spirit of God to the situation. But you see, in carnality, if you could be provoked, oh man, watch out, how easy is it to poke you? You know, most men and women that are married, they know how easily or how not easily they are provoked. When you're a hot air balloon, you can't be poked. No way, because you know what will happen if you do? <laughs> and that's what happens 99% of the time, at least in my perspective, and everything that I deal with on the Internet. 99% of the time on Facebook or Twitter, if I comment on somebody's whatever it may be, they're like a hot air balloon that just got poked. Because what comes out next really is not the Word of God. There's all these rationalizations, justifications, personifications, emotive statements, disruptive behaviors. I mean, you just... You can watch it. It's almost like, write a list and watch them. Check it off, check it off. Check it off. You can make a checklist of it. You know, you can kind of just walk down the list you know, and see what they're going to say next. You know, and I'm amazed at how predictable it is because that's why I find it funny. It's like, don't poke the bull or whatever it says. You know, there's the old expression that says, don't poke the bear or don't poke, yeah, don't poke the bear, you know. Well, you know, if the bear is stuffed full of food, you know, like they are at, you know, Kenai, you poke the bear and he's just going to, you know, he don't care about you. You're too skinny. He wants the fish. <laughs> and you stink, you know, the fish smells good. Something fishy about that one. But my point being is that, are you easily upset over things? And if you are, that means that you're susceptible to carnality. Do you think that no one who is a Christian is ever like that? 
Paul said they are. Matter of fact, Paul demonstrated it. <laughs> and he connected these attitudes with carnality. Is there a truth in the Bible that instantly awakens a spirit of malice or resentment in you? Do you just get ticked off when they start mentioning the church? You know, the church, the church this and church that, you know, and I don't think I gotta go to church because you know what, I'm tired of it. Or are you provoked if I mention the word Obama? Or abortion? Or Obamacare? Or some other word? Do you instantly like flare up? <gasps> you know, and you're already halfway down the road to carnality. Think about it. Do you pay attention? Or are you in attention, just waiting for the moment the other shoe drops and you get stomped on by the shoe dropping on your toe when you don't know what's going on so you immediately react rather than act upon the promptings or the leadings of the Holy Spirit as He chooses to inspire you? Or do you feel like it's all conspired against you to cause you to be provoked and mad? Stop it! Chomp it! Yell about it! If so, that is the proof that you are still carnal. In other words, if you can be provoked, if you're mad at me, you're carnal. Because you know, I, I frankly don't see much problems with letting you vent your thing and going on with what I'm stating. Because you see, that's what I usually do. I'll state, you know, my case and then I'll let it go. And I'm off doing something else because I'll post like 60 or 70 posts, you know, in a day. And I don't have time to worry about, you know, emotionally attached to anything. But people tend to do that now as they're getting emotionally attached to some statement or word they said rather than realize they may have shot off something they didn't mean to say and they can't really retract it now because it's out there to the end of days literally especially on a computer you really should be careful about what you think is on the internet and disappears it ain't gone it's out there still and a lot more people see it than you think. Your friends may only be two, but they get passed around, and guess what? <laughs> that two is 2,000. Zoom! If the process of sanctification is continuing in your life, there will be no trace of that kind of spirit remaining. You can't be provoked. I mean, literally, I, I tell people, you know what? They go, uh, they'll say something about... Uh, are you well they always say are you mad and I'm like how could I get mad about being on the internet I'm not mad I don't get mad you know it's like what a waste I got too much energy challenges meaning that I put a lot of time and energy into some of the things that I'm doing that I really get excited about and I'm enjoying you know as far as posting and they take a lot of energy in order to do it in order to put into it my emotive capabilities of writing as well as the structure of what I'm doing you know sometimes on web design and other things about posting you know as well as the pictures and selecting and chosen and then doing the research behind some of the posts that are off the wall and doing kind of weird things you know that do I really have time to get mad <laughs> please you know what a waste of energy I don't get mad because it is a waste of energy that's what I discovered a long time ago I'm not provoked that way I can be provoked about some things, you know, and I think that they do provoke me, but you see, when I know I'm provoked, I go, Lord, get them. They provoke me, and I go this way. You know, it's like stick something in my stomach, and I look up, God, you see that? Get them. Because my first reaction is, hey, I want God to get them. You know, I, I really do want God to get them, because, you know, if I have to intercede for you, that's different, because then I got to kind of like, you know, get rid of my carnality, because I'm carnal with God. Don't get me wrong. When I pray for you, God help you, because I may be praying, you know, like David, cast their babies on stones. Now, that don't sound like a man of God to me, but he said, smite their little ones with stones and smash them to bits. That's David the king. That's a man of God. <laughs> wow. For some of you, that's your kind of man. For me, that's disgusting. That's David in carnality. But the point is, is I'll pray to God to get you, you know, within limits. And to convict you within reason, you know, and to hold your little skinny body over the coals of fires of hell. No, he doesn't do that kind of stuff. No, but I'll pray that he'll, you know, work in your circumstances, you know, to inspire you. All he has to do is just simply love on you and you'll fall apart. I know, I'm there. <laughs> Whenever I get mad, God loves on me. And <laughs> I can't stay mad when you love me like this. <laughs> it's not fair. You don't fight fair. You fight dirty. You love me. <laughs> And that's the problem that most people have. They don't realize I love them anyways. I don't care what you're doing. That's stupid, you know. It's like, well, yeah, you did something stupid, but so what? I love you. 
you know, it doesn't bother me. What I do care is if it bothers someone else, so, you know, i got to go pick up the pieces of what you did. And believe me, I have picked up the pieces of a lot of ministries I've seen around. And I'll go back over and kind of like, you know, talk to some people that really need some tender, loving care and assuaging the heart because there have been some things done to them that we wouldn't call that Christian. <laughs> If the Spirit of God detects anything in you that is wrong, He doesn't ask you to make it right. He only asks you to accept the light of truth and then He will make it right. And you know, that's the key issue that I've had all along with posting and sharing with people and caring enough to tell you the truth. It's not about being wrong or right. It never has been. I'm not wrong and I'm not right. I'm just telling the truth. Because it always boils down to Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 and James 1, 5. You can ask God any time what to do. And you could be led by God any time you want to. The difference is, are you and will you and can you and did you? Because most of the time, you know and I'm pretty well aware of it, you didn't. Nope, didn't ask about that one. I just went out and shot my mouth off. Because after all, I don't need to ask God about everything. No, you don't. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, if you're being led by Him, you do. But forget that. Who wants to be led by the Spirit of God? Go your way. Good luck. A child of the light will confess instantly and stand completely open before God. I did it. The buck stops here. I did it. And even if I didn't do it, I probably did. And somehow I provoked it. And you know what? Because I provoked it and because I was involved in it, it must have been me because I'm the wiser one and I'm the smarter one. I'm the more mature. So guess what? I'll take all the blame and you just take it over and take it away from me and take over it. And take care of it. <laughs> yeah. I was trained right. <laughs> I've been potty trained. I don't carry poop in my diapers. Do you? Are you carrying around all that garbage in your diapers? I mean, come on now. Grow up. Get rid of it. Start being real with your God. He already knows who's at fault. You are. <laughs> but a child of the darkness will say, Oh, I can explain that. And they bother going about it. And I'm always dumbfounded by the explanations. Because I know the majority of the time that you hear people explain things, it's always stupid. You know, you, you kind of look at it and you go, really? That's your explanation? Man, that's even dumber than your, your reason for, or that's even dumber than the thing that you did in the first place. And then it gets deeper. Have you ever noticed that? One explanation leads to another, and it gets farther and farther away from the problem itself. Which really was, uh, okay. You know, and I, I used to tell people, the greatest thing that God can hear from you or that you could do whenever someone confronts you is just simply say, okay, and then step back, step away, go by yourself alone and pray. Hear that? Say, okay, and then walk away and go pray. That's my bottle. That's my, my teaching I've given constantly to thousands of people. Well, anyways, enough people that, you know, who knows if they did it, but that's what I do. It's like, I'll listen to somebody say something, you know, and my wife knows this, is that Every single word she says all day long, whether it sounds godly or not, it's recorded in my ears. I listen to it. I think about it. I ponder it. By the end of the day, I'm still probably working on it, you know, and I'm going, we're okay, you know, and I take it to God and I try to leave it there or else I go, well, you know, maybe, maybe I'm wrong or something. You know, she says something, you know, kind of like usually no, but <laughs> it's possible. That's why I'm always checking. I'm hoping. Please, God, make me wrong, you know, so that you could be right. You know? Because, you see, I'm more excited about watching the development of somebody grow in the knowledge of Jesus than I am about being right or wrong. That's carnal. That's just dumb. Who cares? God can make you wrong in order to be right. And He can make you right in order to be wrong. Sometimes it happens that way. You were the righteous one, but you were wrong because God didn't tell you to do it. What is the proof that carnality is gone? Never deceive yourself. When carnality is gone, you will know it. It is the most real thing you can imagine. It's just like, you know, you kind of... Carnality's dumb. I mean, you know if you're carnal or not. That's why you know that you're... It's gone, because you know if you're carnal or not. It's just kind of like, yeah, well, I was being carnal that day. You know, kind of like, I flipped, I flipped out. And that kind of shows you that you're no longer carnal, because you know what to do, when to do, how to do it, and what to do with it. You just simply go, oops, okay, God forgive me. Create in me, David said it this way, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, O Lord. 
Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and renew a right spirit within me. And that's what it really boils down to is that when you're less carnal and wanting and desiring to walk in the Spirit, you know immediately when you're yeah, blew it, you know, and you go, ah, God, please forgive me. Take away all the consequences of this action, this sin, and this, this transgression and trespass that I've done. And don't let anyone else be affected, even though I know they will be, even though I may cause all this other repercussions like a pebble dropped in a pond and it affects everyone in the sides of the pond itself because it's going to have ripple effect on everyone else around me in the spiritual dimension as well as in the physical as well as in the emotional so it's going to affect my wife my kids and all the things that are around me as well as my job and everything else in that day that I do those things until I repent you know and ask God to take it away and even then I still have to suffer the consequences because I reap what I sow and I planted a seed and I got to root it out and I got to take care of it and I got to remove it and you know I got to plant new seed and fertilize the soil and make it new and dig it up and get the roots out and get all the you, know, you get it the pesticides and everything else because you took along with that sin all the other pests and everything else that came with it. You didn't know life was like that, did you? <laughs> yeah, that's why we're doing utmost for his highest because we're not talking, you know, like just the superficial kind of Christians. We're talking about men of God, I hope, and women of God, I pray, that we would grow up into the stature of Jesus Christ. And God will see to it that you have a number of opportunities to prove yourself to the miracle of His grace. The proof is in a very practical test. You will find yourself saying, if this had happened before, I would have had the spirit of resentment, or you would have been ticked off. And you will never cease to be the most amazed person in the world or on earth at what God has done with the miracle of you when you see something that used to piss you off. And suddenly you go, <laughs> I don't care. Who cares? It's like, and you just kind of do like I just did. You go, who cares? That ain't no biggie. I mean, come on now. I'm saved. You're saved. We're going to spend eternity together. That's a big deal. But guess what? You're stuck with me. Deal with it. <laughs> and that's the reality of when you find you're less carnal and more operating according to the Spirit of God when you can look at everyone that way and say, huh, <laughs> Little do they know, they're, they're wrong, but they're going to have to deal with me, you know. And we got each other for eternity. God bless you, because you know what? That'll change your perspective. I pray that you will find yourself not like a hot air balloon easily provoked and, you know, spewing out your hot air, you know, afterwards because you got poked, you know. But rather, you'd find yourself laughing more, living less on the defensive and more in the comprehension of the joy of the Lord that God can give you that it can't be taken away unless you let it happen to you by getting upset over something you need not have been worried about in the first place.